Those are some of the first steps that you absolutely have to make. But the driving force of all of this is basically how are you investing the assets that you've saved? Or if you're still accumulating, what is the strategy that you have to put in place to make sure that you have that income come to you each and every year? Uh, to help us with this, I brought on Matt Horsley. Uh, he's a senior financial planner at Pure Financial Advisors, been in the business for 20 some odd years. Uh, and so it's a real pleasure to bring you on board, Matt. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, Joe, for having me. Hey, so let's talk about investing. So there's hundreds of different ways that you can invest your money, right? And so what, uh, help our viewers out, what are some strategies or what should they focus in on to give them the highest probability of success? Yeah, so I, I think when you look at it, there, there literally are, I mean, there, there's hundreds, if not thousands of ways to invest your money, but really it comes down to, to two different approaches. And the first approach is what we call more of a conventional approach to investing, and, and it's what most of us are used to over time for the past 30, 40, 50 years. And I remember growing up as a kid, uh, my, my dad uh, over dinner answering the phone from a stockbroker trying to sell him a stock. So, so this is an approach that um, in some ways is uh, you believe you have some ability as an investor to time the market or to figure out which stocks to buy and sell or when to be in small cap stocks or large cap stocks or international emerging markets, whatever it might be. So, so, there's, some, so there's some crystal ball approach. And, and you may be uh, listening to Jim Cramer on CNBC or, or reading uh, Money Magazine or Forbes or whatever it might be to get some of your advice in that way. So compare that to what's, what's called more of an evidence-based approach to investing, or we call an institutional approach. And, and what that basically says is that we believe that markets, capital markets work, and that at any, at any given time, the prices of securities or stocks are fair. Because there's so many people, but not just individual investors, but computer algorithms, analyzing every bit of information about every stock that's publicly traded every second of every day. So to think that you or I or anybody might be smaller than the collective market um, really is, is, is an impossibility, and that's what the studies have shown. So, so you got a traditional view, which most people are aware of, but you, you might look at that and in, in call it gambling because they're trying to predict the future or they're trying to, to find the next Google or Microsoft or Facebook or, or whatever or, it is. Right, or, or Tesla or Apple or, or whatever it might be. But I, I think really when you compare the two approaches, the institutional approach is a much more disciplined way to invest. And basically what that says is that what I want to do is I want to have a fully diversified portfolio controlling all the things that I can control. And we've, and we've talked about that in the show and, and during the classes that we teach and we talk to clients all the time is control fees, control taxes, control how you diversify your portfolio, and then control how you manage that portfolio over time. So really the difference is, is in the conventional approach, it's almost like you're going to Vegas with your money and you're gambling, or you're going to Del Mar on the racetrack and you're betting on horses, and the, the potential uh, outcomes could be gigantic. Right, it's, it's again, it's that hope strategy. I, I hope I make it big. I hope I make money in the markets this year versus expecting a certain rate of return. It, exactly, and if you control those things that you can, then you can narrow down those expected returns to come back to your financial plan that you've put together and say, okay, well, if my target rate of return is, say, 6 or 7%, if I can do that and do all the things I want to do in my lifetime, then I'm going to be in great shape. Well, I mean, that, that, that sounds reasonable, but why don't people do it? Why don't people implement that strategy? That, because well, that, you, you would look at the studies. I think most people still do the conventional, traditional way. Sure, and what all the evidence says is that there's this, um, there's this huge gap. Uh, that we, it's called a behavior gap between what people should do and what they actually do do. Uh, as investors. So it, it's a gap that might be akin or, or, or is why from an investing standpoint or accomplishing goals is the Grand Canyon. And so basically what that says is that here's what I should be doing, but as a, as a human being, my mind is wired to make certain decisions that might not make sense financially. And, and a lot of those are based upon fear and greed. Well, I mean, there's biases too, right? If you take a look today, I think most people will say, well, the U.S. markets is the place to be because the U.S. markets have had such a, a huge run. So this recency bias, I think, is damage, uh, you know, putting damage on someone's portfolio, the, so you need damage control. No question about it. And I think that that's one of the biggest disservices that sometimes the media uh, does to investors these days. So, th so that bias, the recency bias, says that as an investor, I'm much more concerned about what's happened over the course of the past 12, 16, 18 months than looking at my long-term goals and the long-term picture. And of course, when you do that, you, you, you might say to yourself, well, yeah, I know over time that if I have a diversified portfolio and I'm disciplined about it, then I'm gonna succeed. But what most of us do as investors, we say, well, if you look at 2014, the S&P 500 was up about 13%. Uh, the Dow Jones was up 10%. But if you had a fully diversified portfolio, you might be up three, four, 5%. And, and that's because international stocks didn't do well, emerging markets, 
bonds didn't do great, you know, some of the different things like that. So as an investor, you sometimes might lose your discipline and start to become a little bit more, you know, leaning towards, well, I'm going to sell out of this stuff and then just buy into the S&P 500 because, hey, it was up 13% last year. That's recency bias. Right. So they're just looking at the review mirror, what performed the best, and let's just load up on that particular asset class. That's exactly right. It, and then you got the herd mentality, too. The, the herd it's just mentality. like, well, yeah, if, my, if my neighbor's doing it, if my coworker's doing it, someone that I respect, I'm going to con- I'm, I'm going to continue to do that. Yeah. But, but, but let's take a look at this. So all of these biases that people have, and then they're, they're investing their money probably not not necessarily in a prudent way. Um, what effect do you think that has on actual performance or real dollars? Well, the, the numbers actually fully reflect the, the really the catastrophic results that these mistakes can have if people aren't handling this in a dis- disciplined way. And essentially what it states is that if you look at performance of the S&P 500, over the course of the past 20 years, it's averaged roughly 8, 8.5%, while the individual investor has averaged closer to 4%. If you take that over a longer period of time, over 30 years, the S&P's averaged close to 11, while the individual investor has averaged closer to 7. So that's a 7% spread, and that's really the behavior gap that we're talking about that can really cause a complete collapse of your financial plan. Um, and if you look at what does that mean from a dollar standpoint, in terms of my, my overall ability to create income, uh, as an example, let's just say you invested a million bucks, and you had 20 years to grow that money at a 4% rate of return, that million dollars is going to turn into roughly 2.1 million or so, if you had the, the discipline to be able to do that for 20 years. Uh, at an 8% return, if you just followed the market and had a diversified portfolio, you average closer to 8, 8.5%. That's a 4% spread. Now, you're at about 4.3 million bucks. So that difference is roughly $2 million. On that $2 million, as you and Al were talking about, how much cash flow or what's your distribution from that, that figure, it's roughly an $80,000 a year difference in your cash flow. Those, those numbers are what matters. It's your ability to create the income that you need to do all the things that you want to do so you're not going to outlive the money that you have. So these doll bar studies come out. They take a look at an average mutual fund investor. And so the average rate of return of the overall markets were, what, 8%, while the average investor, you and I and everyone else, has done 4 That's a 4% spread. And the reason for that is they're getting in and out of the markets at the wrong time. They're, they're, they're doing the hunch, you know, hey, well, here, I have a hot stock that I think I'm going to purchase. And, of course, they're buying it when it's all-time highs. And so all these different things that we hear in the media are hurting the investor. And I think one of the biggest reasons why people are not successful, it's not of, of, of inflation, taxes, longevity, and all these other things. It, it, it's themselves. It's them being able to control their overall behavior when things go bad. There's no question. We, we are indeed our, our own worst enemies when it comes to, to investing and accomplishing all of our goals because we, we react to those chemicals that we have inside of our brain. It's a fight or flight mentality. And we saw that during the, the collapse, the dot-com collapse in 2000 and in 07, 08 as well, is that when markets are down, we have this tendency or this fear that we want to get out you know, before it goes to zero. Well, in our minds, we know long term that's not going to happen. If you say discipline with your approach, then you can accomplish all of your goals. So if you're looking at things like taxes, real estate, your investments, estate planning, insurance, those are all the things that you have to take into account to make sure that you're going to be successful with your overall planning. And I think every investor should take the chance and really learn more about this. Watching the show is one thing, but then the other thing is, is really educating yourself uh, and P- at Pure, we teach uh, over seven or eight different colleges around San Diego. I would highly encourage our, our viewers to, to uh, come to one of those classes, cost you a few bucks. It's six hours of great material. Um, and I think that the, uh, the website's purefinancial.com. You go right to the website, sign up, and get educated.